Getting out of your own way is, you know, don't let the story define you. The story is what you're projecting to the world. What I'm more concerned with is who are you when you're in your room at midnight or one in the morning and the lights are out, right? Who's that person? How does that person feel about themselves? What's going on with that person, right? Because fundamentally, that's who we all are. When we get away from that notion, right? Who are we when we are alone? How, what degree of comfort do I have with myself? What issues do, am I really grappling with? When we get away from that, we start believing in our own stories. And some of the, the dismal failures I see in business is that people started believing too much in their own stories. Because there are enough yes people that will, you'll see as you move up or your organization who will feed into those stories. And they're left with this image that's based on very little of substance in terms of who they really are. Right? And they come to me and they say, can you help me coach here because I feel like I've lost myself. I'm like, you know, the best thing I can do is refer you to somebody, right? Because I'm not a therapist. Um, and that's really too bad when it's gotten that far. So I urge you to, if you want to do anything with your MBA, it's do it in your terms with who you are through your voice, owning your space, okay? Um, have you jumped to defensiveness or cognitive dissonance? Those are a couple of tools to use just in terms of the self-awareness to ask yourself, right? Whenever we're defensive, you can pretty much ask, why am I being defensive in all relationships in life, right? Why am I being defensive in this situation? It's a good cue. If that happens, ask yourself, hmm, why am I feeling the need to be defensive? Chances are there's something that you really value that's being said that's tweaked somewhere in your mind that's ruffled those feathers. And the trick is for you to figure out what are those feathers mean, right? And I think that's a big part of the MBA program. When those feathers come up, am I aware of them? Why did they happen? Or cognitive dissonance, right? And we won't get too deeply into social psych, but dissonance isn't a huge issue, right? The cognitive dissonance we're talking about when we have an attitude or a view, a mental um, frame, and our behavior deviates from that framework, right? And so our, we can't fool our minds, and so there's often that dissonance between who we think we are, who we espouse to be, and then who we're behaving as. So when you feel that sort of, ugh, that gut reaction that this doesn't feel right, why are you feeling it, right? Again, take time. I always say to leaders that, you know, taking that extra moment, you're not going to get to the end of your job and say, wow, I wish I hadn't taken that five minutes of silence. It didn't help me out today. And I wish I had jumped into that meeting quicker. Right? Not a lot of them want to do that. So what I urge you to do is take that extra time. Right? And in a digital world, it's not that easy to do, to carve that out. But I think it's essential. Listening like a cow. This is a fun one. Um, and I mean it literally. So I had the, the very good fortune of, of uh, being with um, at a 3M teaching fellow group, and I realize when I say that, I'm getting in my way, right? It's, it's this literally where it happened. It was a magical event. It was held um, at, in Banff, which is, if you've been there, you know, a magical setting. So I'm not sure what sort of kismet was in the air, but myself and about 12 other academics, we had an unbelievable five days together, transformative, truly life transformative, and to the point where we keep in touch um, and we have annual gatherings. It's, it's really, I, I, I don't tend to believe in those things, but this is an, a remarkable group. That's all as a preface, a little bit of getting in my own way, to say that one of the books that we shared there, it, it's really on teaching, uh, is written by Mary Rose O'Reilly. It's called Radical Presence, and she talks about listening like a cow. So this isn't my, uh, this isn't my theme at all, but I, I'm shameless in adopting it. And what she's talking about, if you talk about the cow metaphor, my, my family, we have a, a cottage just north of Kingston, something uh, that's been in the family forever. But I love to go there, and, and my wife and I often, uh, you know, ride our mountain bikes around. And we've often, well, we often, she watches me most of the time, get off of my bike and, uh, and talk to cows. And I would urge you to do the same if you get that option. Because what you'll find they do is, 
It, has anybody done that? Has anybody talked to a cow? Anybody from a farm? <laughs> there you go. So what, what I found that is remarkable with them, you see people have, is that what cows tend to do is when, they start, when you start talking to them, there's this kind of tilt in the head, and then they usually walk toward you, and then they will stare into your soul, right? <laughs> with those big, beautiful eyes. They stare into your soul. And I swear I've talked to them for, a, well, my wife exaggerates. She says 15 minutes, I say five. And either way, right, is to talk to that cow because there's an unbelievable sense that they're taking everything you have in. Now, whether or not they are, right, I've heard vets tell me, don't say they aren't, because I think they are. That's not the issue, right? But the issue is really about, are you listening like a cow, right? Are you sitting there, and are you in the moment? Because usually when we listen, we think, how can I relate? Where can I jump in? Where's the pause? Am I now ready to jump in? Versus being 100% present, right? It's a very different paradigm to think about. So being 100% in that moment. And what Mary Rose O'Reilly said in her book that I felt that day and at different times in my life is that when people listen to you like that, she says life is truly up for grabs. And of course, she means more than just work, right? She means, wow, that changes lives, right? When people listen to you like that. So just think of that opportunity that as business people, you really want to understand communication, we'll get to know how to listen. And one of the great things, if you can remember it, right, is the cow metaphor. I think that that could be, could be helpful. It's certainly been helpful in my career. Embracing paradox. Um, something that's increasingly talked about in business schools, for sure. Prevalence of paradox in our lives. Well, sir, first of all, what is a paradox? Right, so a paradox is, you know, when we have two seemingly contradictory things. Um, presented to you usually in the form of a phrase. So let's, let's look at a few, like plan, but, we'll, but be willing to throw away the plan. As MBA students, we used to anyway, MBA students used to freak out around that. Well, sir, what do you mean? Which one do you want me to do? Right? Plan and be willing to throw away the plan. What I want you to do is both. Right? And that's what we're really getting at. That in dealing with paradox, do you feel comfortable in between? Do you understand the importance of both sides of that paradox? And reconciling paradox is about feeling comfort with the paradox, right? We can't wait in business till the perfect time, but we have to wait long enough until we feel, I've, got, I've made a reasonable amount of information here. None of us work in perfect information. We know that. But how much do I need to make a decision? And that helps us with the whole, look, I've got to execute now, versus the I executed a week ago, and look at me how great I am, right? So wherever that comfort level is, know that. The whole take chances but look before you leap is along the same ones. One that I'd like to talk about a little bit because I love Thomas Wolfe is we're fixed and certain when we are in movement. And I love that. I, love, I hope you'll give that one some thought, uh, maybe as, as you come to a conclusion tomorrow. We're fixed and certain when we're in movement. And you know, I think that can be true, and I think you could, you could phrase it, you know, that we're moving the most when we're fixed. And if you can sit with that and understand sort of where that paradox fits into your own life, that's what I'm trying to get with you. How comfortable are you at sitting with paradox? And as the future business leaders, you know, how comfortable will you be when faced with paradox? Because the pressure in this environment is to act immediately, right? And what I'm asking you to do is think that it's actually a little bit more complex than that. So lessons from psychodynamics. I won't take too much of your time. Um, I thought these might be fun to go through, but I'm cognizant of time. So um, I will just talk about dissonance. Oh, I have talked about cognitive dissonance, right? So we, we've covered that. Um, projection is a very important thing. It's often when you see or, or if you want to sort of cue yourself as to how do I know that projection is going on, it's when you're talking to someone, right, often, and you'll hear them uh, talk about something that they really don't like either about themselves or their own environment, and they'll, they'll see that, that in you, right? So an example would be, you know, they have an issue with being late or being tardy or being on time, and they rip, your boss rips into you for being on time, uh, for being late, and you haven't been late before, right? A classic projection. And so to know that and understand that sort of, is this person's issue? I'm gonna own my space. Good luck with that, right? 
uh, good luck with that, that's not mine. So you're projecting onto me. And transference and countertransference, um, similar things, it'll take me just a little bit too long, and I don't mean that pejoratively at all, just literally we don't have time. Uh, taking ownership. So a big part of sort of as we wrap up this talk is around owning the space you occupy, coming back to that, right? Feeling really comfortable over what you do and the space that you occupy, right? You occupy a space, you're in an MBA program, take advantage of that. Don't apologize for your opinion. Make it known in class, right? It may, you may find that there are contradictory views, that your opinion changes, that's fantastic. But own your space, right? Um, I often tell the story of owning my space. When I was doing my master's degree, and it wasn't an MBA, it was a thesis-based uh, degree, um, <laughs> and I was giving uh, a presentation in a seminar, and a uh, fantastic U of T professor, uh, I say fantastic because I love him, but God, was he awful at times. Um, <laughs> he, uh, uh, I had a cold that day, and so at various times I had to blow my nose during the presentation, you know, one of those awful colds that just hits at the end of term. Um, and I apologized a couple of times in my presentation. And near the end, he is bangs his table, right? Uh, and it's a whole class, right? It's a master's class. And I'm sort of startled. And he said, you know, Murphy, would you stop apologizing? Right? And he took me into his office afterwards and, and ex explained how no one cares that you're sneezing. We all get you had a cold, right? Start owning a little bit of the space that you have. And it was a really, really good lesson. Um, in terms of, wow, you know, you're right. I don't need to apologize for who I am. I don't need to apologize for space, right? We all have these things. We all have issues that we're dealing with at the time. Move on with life, right? Um, maybe a harsh way of saying it, but it did the trick for me. Uh, know your feelings. We've touched on that developing self-awareness is so important. Owning your feelings and avoiding dissonance. If you make a fault, right? I made a mistake. It can sometimes be the most cathartic thing to say. Not only for you, but for the people around you to hear that, you know, you indeed are just as fallible as they are. And to sit with yourself. If there is one thing I want you to walk away with, it's that notion of feeling comfortable with who you are. So in terms of wrap-up, I would just say, lead yourself in terms of self-awareness, listening and owning. Let that process start today, or enhance today, I should say, because many of you are probably already on yourself on that journey. Be yourself, don't fall into that trap of chasing ghosts, and by chasing ghosts I mean, we've all had leaders that we really have looked up to, or people in our lives can come from all sorts of places. They can be a positive influence, but you're not gonna be them, you're gonna be you. You won't serve the world well, by being them, but you'll serve it incredibly well by being you. So take parts of what you learn, you know, like the professor story I said, right? but I'm not that professor, right? I don't kick butt in class, it's just not me. Um, so you gotta know who you are and feel, feel good about that. At the end, it's sort of a reminder to be human. It, that's a very powerful thing, that being human and sort of owning who you are can very much resonate with people. So thank you for your time this morning. I wish you incredibly well in the program. I'd like to remind you that my door is always open to you, that as a team here, that your success is our success, that we want you to continue to go out there and build the fact that the, the best MBAs are coming out of Ryerson, and we know why, because we do things differently, okay? And absolutely, um, if you get the chance, try to think about why you're here and who you are. Thanks very much. received one of these, the Dean is getting one too. So there's a bit of solidarity here in terms of being together. We certainly appreciate his wonderful presentation, tremendous insights. I now feel very vulnerable, um, but that was tremendous. I also know why my neighbor's cows, my neighbor's cows are all screwed up, but anyway, that's <laughs> okay, so Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.